Dr. Hovind, I love your doctoral thesis. I've torn it to pieces with Howes and Garfield. I can't remember when I last pissed myself laughing. It's a good thing the thesis mopped the piss off the floor. Welcome to part 24 of this read-through and peer review of Kent Hovind's doctoral dissertation, which was published on Wikileaks.org on December 9th, 2009. If you have not yet seen any of the previous instalments in this series, then I recommend that you go back and see those first, as this episode will start exactly where we left off in the last. In the last episode, Kent told us all about the Rockefellers and their use of evolution in business. He also told us how Darwin took the credit when Alfred Russell Wallace published his book a year before Darwin's which he didn't. Kent continues. He, as in Alfred Russell Wallace, emphasised a struggle for existence, the survival of the fittest and natural selection. Wallace had very little education. He served at an apprenticeship for a while. Yes, Kent, Wallace didn't have a great formal academic education. Unfortunately, that was cut short due to financial issues, but he did serve his apprenticeship for six years and he did go on to teach that subject that he served his apprenticeship in. On top of that, he read lots and lots and lots of books. And we're not talking about the kids' science books that you read, Kent. We're talking about proper scientific books books and papers and journals. It was during one of the many long evenings in Leicester Library that he met the entomologist Henry Bates who got him started collecting beetles, got him interested in biology. It was later at the age of 23 that he corresponded with Bates and discussed Charles Darwin's journal, Charles Lyell's Principle of Geology. This guy was smart. This guy, quite independent of Darwin, stumbled upon what is effectively the most important, the most influential scientific discovery in the field of biology. He didn't give lectures to creatard audiences about dinosaurs on the ark. But we'll get back on subject. He read Thomas Paine's book, The Age of Reason, as a teenager and became very sceptical in matters of religion. Like I said, Kent, he was a smart guy. Ended right in with ideas of socialism, Marxism and anarchism. Yes, Kent, because at the time, Wallace lived in Victorian England, which was the centre of the British Empire, an imperial monarchy. Ideas such as socialism, Marxism and anarchism were new and radical and weren't as tainted as they are today. He was heavily influenced by Matthias book. What book is that, Kent? You don't say. And he believed in spiritualism and the occult. Yes, Kent. Spiritualism was very, very popular in Victorian England. Very popular indeed especially amongst those who had rejected Christianity, because they say it was bullshit. To his credit, Wallace did start off down that path, examining it scientifically, but unfortunately got drawn into it and started to believe the rhetoric. Kent goes on. Wallace was a pantheist, whereas Darwin became more and more of an atheist. They kind of split over the ideas of whether there was really a god. Well, not really, Kent. Wallace was most definitely an atheist. What Darren and Wallace were split over was spiritualism. As you said, Wallace was an advocate of spiritualism, but not as a religion, more of a philosophy. 
Wallace advocated scientific study of spiritualism. The guy might have been wrong, but at least he had scientific reason to back up his convictions. But anyway, Kent continues. Because of Wallace's spiritualist, pantheist and occult teaching of evolution, he could really be considered the founding father of the New Age movement. Yeah, right, Kim. No, not really. He lived in Malaysia for about eight years and watched the spiritualist rituals that those people performed. He developed many of his theories in that setting. Yes, Kent, he did. Darwin went on the Beadle for five years and went to the Galapagos. Wallace, on the other hand, went to Malaysia for eight years. And while there, studying the local flora and fauna, came across an interesting discovery. Plants and animals at one end of the Malay archipelago were more like those in Asia, whereas those towards the other end were more like those in Australia. The demarcation point, the line in the middle, is known today as the Wallace Line. But Kent continues to banter on about New Age crap. The New Age movement is nothing more than the old rebellion against God and the belief in evolution, with a little Hindu and Buddhist religion mixed in with it. Yes, Kent, and let's not forget the candles, crystals, camper vans and caftans, eh? And if we're going to reduce each other's religions to their component parts, who is it exactly who worships a flying zombie with multiple personality disorder? Hey. I mean, come on, Kent, on the batshit crazy league table, it gotta be somewhere near the top. I mean, even Jesus wasn't Christian. He was Jewish. But anyway, Kent goes on. Let's continue our journey through the history of evolution. The next man we come to is Thomas Huxley. He was born in 1825 and died in 1895. Huxley was called Darwin's Bulldog. He actively promoted Darwin's work after his publication of Origin of Species. Yes, Kent, but what you leave out was that up until Darwin, Huxley was very against evolution. We can see that in his savage review of Robert Chambers' Vestiges of the Natural History of Creation, a book which contained some quite pertinent arguments in favour of evolution. Huxley also rejected Lamarck's theory of transmutation on the basis that there was insufficient evidence to support it. Huxley was a sceptic. However, on hearing Darwin's theory of natural selection, Huxley's famous response was, how extremely stupid not to have thought of that. Huxley knew a good idea when he heard it. He was very strong in his beliefs and anxious for Christianity to be overthrown. Actually, he disagreed with all forms of organised religion, especially the Catholic Church. Thomas Huxley did not claim to be an atheist. He claimed to be an agnostic. He is the one that actually made up the term agnostic. I'm guessing that nobody presented him with any evidence that was convincing enough. But at least the guy was smart enough not to rule out the possibility that there could be. You see, Kent, that's the difference between people like him and people like you. While you are willing to believe that you know the absolute truth based on just one book, Huxley was only willing to base his beliefs after examining all the evidence. And even then wasn't arrogant enough to be absolutely 100% sure. 